How did you find your way over to Nuremberg? I was working at Bletchley, uh, at the uh, Enigma place. Right. And uh, Peter Calvacresi, who was my boss there, was asked to form a uh, joint intelligence commission to go to Nuremberg to advise on high command matters. You know, we had dealt with well, uh, the group that we were dealing with was the Air Force mostly. And uh, there was, you know, some possibility that the defendants would come up with uh, superior orders, claims, and so forth, and we were there to to say that's not the way it was, you know, that's explain how how the high command had run in Germany during that, uh, during the war. So that's how I got there in the first place, and then I, we were there to advise the, all, all delegations, all the four delegations. And then at the end of that, uh, 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 General Taylor, who was going to take over the subsequent proceedings, asked us if we'd stay on and work with him on them. So we did. How long were you there then? I was there from, I guess it was about September uh, 45 until well, early in 48, I think. Alva was was my superior as far as our, our delegation was concerned. Right. And we just provided information for the various delegations as they mm -hmm. So it would depend on that. I, we did tend to work more with the British group than the, since we were all British. Uh, so the, we, I had more connection with them than I did with any of the others, although we also did work for the French and the Americans. I'm just going to ask, you just meant, did not mention the Russians. Did you have any inter face with them at all? But not as much, because there was a certain language problem there, and uh, they had brought most of, I guess, most of their own uh, research analysts and so forth with them, so they Did had you? plenty of people. The, the, the problem with the American delegation was that very few of them spoke German, so they had to depend on us to read documents for them and tell them what the documents actually said. Uh, the Russians, I guess, had enough people who spoke German, so they didn't they didn't uh, particularly ask us a recollection anyway. We did, did have some contact with them. Opportunity to go to the attend any of the trials? Oh yeah, we could if we if we didn't have any urgent work to do, we could pop down to the courtroom and sit in the back row and watch. When you walked in that first day. It and saw those 21 defendants that you probably only had seen on newsreels, what did you think? Uh, they, they looked pretty, pretty, uh, pretty shabby. Um, I don't know, you know, I didn't feel that they were particularly impressive. Goering was impressive when he got on the stand because he was so intelligent. And uh, But... You know, I, I, uh, I don't remember being overly impressed by any of them other than him. Any, any conversation uh, among your group as to whether, the, uh, as far as Jackson wasn't going, his, his, his leadership, his management, because he seemed to be, uh, the American delegation seemed to be the, the larger of the group. Yeah, that's true. Uh, no, I don't particularly recall anything like that. I remember there was some discussion when he did cross-examine Goering that, that Goering had sort of put one over on him. Mm -hmm. But he did pull it together when he, uh, when he made his final statement, so uh, uh, that was not a problem. No, I don't think, you know, I don't think there was any, uh, any problem with him at all. How did you end up in the United States? I married an American. <laughs> did you meet him in Nuremberg? Yes. No. Oh. Was he, an, was he an attorney or just a, uh, or I said just? Uh, in the subsequent proceedings, he came over the following year, the, in 1946, when they uh, were hiring people to take on the, they had, I believe it was 12 subsequent trials after the IMT. And what was his case? Medical case. Medical case? What did, what did, did, did you also work on that case? No. No. What was his impression of that case? Uh, well, impression, I don't know. <laughs> um, 
he was a bit disgusted with the with the evidence that came up as a as a, as a result of checking into the treatment of prisoners and pr treatment of uh, the concentration camp inmates. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he enjoyed putting his his. Uh, his defendants in jail. The results of the experiments are used while the scientist who carried them out is eliminated. The Reichführer SS himself has seen the experiments, and I can state that without exaggerating, helped and sim stimulated in every phase of these experiments. I enjoyed the experience. I think I, I enjoyed being able to travel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as far as that went, that was more more important to me than the actual trial. Right. Sounds pretty selfish, but that you know that's the way it was. I was young, and uh, you know it was it was interesting at the time. But to tell you the honest truth, I found my experience at Bletchley so much more interesting that that uh, it kind of overshadows the the Nuremberg experience. Well, talk to me a little bit about how did you get recruited for Bletchley? I was drafted. Ah. Where were you from originally? Scotland. Scotland? So you're drafted to Bletchley, and um, who did you work with there at Bletchley? With uh, uh, Jim Rose was the head of our office, the air uh, group, Alba Cressy. And that was that. What were you involved in there? Well, we, we took the uh, decoded messages and evaluated them and kept made files on them and figured out what they meant and sent uh, messages to the front depending on what was necessary to be sent. So you were right on the front line there. Pretty much. Yeah. Were you surprised of the success that they had at Bletchley? No. No. That would say, I mean, it's an amazing story. I know I've, there's been a couple of History Channel documentaries on that. No, it was, you know, there was, we, we just took for granted, that, I guess, the fact that we, uh, we had the information. Right. And uh, then we just had to figure out what to do with it once we had it. So that's what we were sitting around doing all the time, figuring out what to do with it. Did you have a sense at all that some of it might be false information? No. No? They weren't sending any red herrings or... Oh, because they didn't know that the code had been broken. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't dire. We were not in distress. Right. We did have to get up a number of times and go to air raid shelters, but that was okay, you know. I had, I had a little more of that after I went to work in Wedgley, but because we were about 50 miles out of London then. You were more inclined to see planes coming over there. Mm -hmm. Was there a sense of immediacy at Bletchley? Yes. Uh, I remember some, you know, super exciting times. For example, when the invasion was going on, hmm. everybody came to work and stayed there all day and all night, just to get us to, to get the. Uh, the reports coming in from the front. Right. So that was exciting. As the reports first came in, were they optimistic or were they, I mean, you, you hear about now at certain areas that were really uh, quite uh, uh, well, devastating. I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't all as planned. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of concern, a lot of worry, but, uh, there was also a lot of feeling that it was that in the long run everything was going all right.